If you remember in the allegory of the cave, which is in the Republic, Mm -hmm. the philosopher not only ascends to see the sun, the philosopher then descends back into the cave. And Plato takes great pains to emphasize that is as important as the ascent out. And so this is one of the new things that's happening is a reorientation to not just the ascent up, but the return back. Yeah. Why is, why is tracing out that whole line up and down important? I think what we're dealing with there are the kinds of knowing that ultimately ground our ability to make sense, to participate in the intelligibility of reality. Reality makes sense to us. And that is not properly or exclusively being done by our propositional knowing. Welcome back to The Transmission, my friends. When it comes to grappling with what's been called the meaning crisis, or just wrestling with the inevitable philosophical and spiritual goblins that life is going to throw at you. Uh, To stretch this metaphor, there's no shortage of voices claiming to offer techniques by which you can subdue said goblins. And I'll just be blunt about it. I do not think many of those voices are offering you something real. I think many of them have ulterior motives. I think some of them are downright delusional. And I think the majority overstep their philosophical and intellectual firepower. Then there's Professor John Vervacki. I remember encountering his Awakening from the Meaning Crisis series a few years ago now, probably, and thinking to myself, that's quite a title. But I was floored by what was contained within Uh, an overview of everything from ancient Greek philosophy and mysticism to modern cognitive science. And what honestly might be even more impressive about it is it's not just a scattershot, it's all aimed at one target, becoming a fully philosophically self-sufficient being. This is not a way of thinking that tells you how to think, what to be, what to believe, It's equipping you with the tools to actually be a philosopher, you know, approaching big questions and life in a way that is truly concerned with truth, truly concerned with getting closer to whatever that transcendent truth is, even though we can never fully arrive there. And in addition to Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, John has another fantastic and deep diving series that's more recent. It's called After Socrates. And it is also just brimming with wonder nuggets. And John also has dozens of other fabulous lectures, podcasts, and more to check out on his YouTube channel. It shall all be linked in the description. Uh, As initiated listeners would expect, the topics in this mind meld are wide ranging. There are some through lines, the immortal value of platonic philosophy, the value of mystical experiences, and what John calls non-propositional knowing, that sort of knowledge you can only gain by actually doing, by actually experiencing. Of course, there's a little dash of examining the nature of reality, what it actually means to live a good life, and how a lot of that, or at least much of that, flows into modern cognitive science. And with that, my fellow sentient sacks of stardust. As mentioned, everything you will need for John Vervacki is in the description. Do tickle that algorithm with a like, a sub, a comment, a share. It is immensely important. And if you're digging the content, my friends, I have great news because we have over 300 podcasts just like this one, including one with Professor John Vervacki that exist only on podcast platforms. So do subscribe to Third Eye Drops wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you would like to go deeper, riff with me and about 200 other Wonder Dippers now, uh, and also get rewards like stickers, pins, shirts, and more, and support the show, join us over at patreon.com forward slash third eye drops. So much love to all of you uh, members of the Wonder Lodge over there. And without further ado, let's meld minds with the wise John Vervacki. It is so, I'm really overjoyed to have you back in the mind meld. It's been a a long time coming, at least from from my perspective and the listener's perspective. You're continuously one of the most requested guests. And for good reason, because every time I approach your work, I'm both very impressed and honestly somewhat intimidated. I'm always like, 
man, like you're you're coming at you know the meaning crisis. What meaning even is? What you know? Some of the biggest questions you can possibly come at, and you're coming at them in really sophisticated, multi-layered ways. So, it, so it almost makes entering into conversation with you at all intimidating, but but also very exciting. So, I'm just really looking forward to it in general. Well, I'm going to ask you because I need help at trying to be true to those levels, but make them all mutually accessible to as many people who are might be possibly uh, interested or find value in them. I sometimes get a little too uh, monological in, <laughs> in my own uh, vocabulary. Um, it's important to have a specialized vocabulary to make thought precise, but there's, that's in a trade-off uh, with making sure that people have access to what you're doing. And so yeah. I'm going to ask for your help to, to keep me true to that. Sure, sure. I'll do my best. I'll do my best. Um, though, though, I I, I feel like I would regret if I if I tried to keep keep your your brain on a leash because man, your <laughs> your 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 brain's a lot of fun, and and everything that you're doing with it is is tremendously fun. But I do come at a lot of this stuff from a more mythopoetic angle, and sure, sure, that's one of the. There's so many reasons why Platonism is throbbingly relevant and interesting to this day. But for me, that that's one of them, is that it really provides a satisfying template for both meaning making, you know, in a in a direct sense, in a direct subjective sense, but also it's it's really one of the only schools of philosophy that I can think of that both satisfies that and seems to as you've argued in the in the talk i just mentioned for instance seems to be an indispensably important template for explaining the underlying ontological reality that we exist in and it's only been around 2500 years and it's <laughs> you know still still relevant now seemingly and and that's just mind-blowing to me. And it's also kind of mind-blowing that for whatever reason, it doesn't quite get the shine that, you know, like a shine, the shine of like a Gnosticism or the Hermeticism, like everybody yeah. likes to talk about those, but they're like, Hey, or, I, or I'm like, Hey, <laughs> those are really out of context without Platonism's existence. In fact, both of those are, are, are highly Platonizing in a lot of senses, but what what initially drew you to Platonism, John? So what initially drew me to Platonism is when I had left uh, my fundamentalist Christian upbringing and was uh, a, a, a sort of drifting, <laughs> overwhelmed, overturned by my own personal meaning crisis, which at that time I thought was you know, the narcissism of, of adolescence, I thought was particular and specific and special to me. And of course, it was one way in which I was special and all that kind of bullshit that uh, was wrapped up in whatever truth was there. <clears throat> but um, of course, I was seeking. Um, and I encountered the figure of Socrates in a first year course on philosophy when we did the Republic, which I still find mm. Uh, I can't tell if the Republic or the Symposium are my two favorite, which one is my most favorite platonic dialogue, but uh, uh, definitely uh, the Republic. And I encountered the figure of Socrates, and I saw in the figure of Socrates what I had been seeking, um, a development, a cultivation of a profoundly existential, even spiritual rationality that had been denied to me in my fundamentalist Christianity, wedded to um, the cultivation of the love, a profound love for wisdom and a kind of self-transcendence self and connectedness to what's ultimate thereby. And uh, that was like, wow. And also part of it, again, was the young adults. Um, um, wow, Socrates wins every argument, and I would love to win every argument. But of mm -hmm. course, as you read deep, more deeply, you realize Socrates doesn't win every argument. Right. 
and he even undermines Parmenides. His own arguments. Yeah, Parmenides and Socrates will also undermine his own arguments that seem to victorious. And then Plato is continually reminding us not to be seeking victory, but to be seeking wisdom. And yeah. so that that was part of it. At the same time, uh, as that was happening, I was still, this was the final year or so I was li living with my parents and so still living under that shadow of fundamentalism. So I would, uh, but I had become deeply um, influenced by, uh, you know, um, exposures to Hinduism and Buddhism. And so I was doing some very basic meditation late at night when everybody was asleep, <laughs> sitting in, on, in my balcony bed. Uh, my sister below me, we were very poor, um, she asleep. So I'd have to wait till all of that. And I was sitting there meditating in the dark and that really sort of artificially uh, elevated position, which, you know, who knows how that was conducive or not. Um, and I had my first mystical experience. Oh, wow. Like many mystical experiences, I can't quite fully explain it, but I, and it wasn't, it wasn't, it's hard to say. It was something more than visualization, but it had a sensual quality to it. And it was sort of trans-geometrical. It wasn't geometrical. It was more multidimensional yeah. and vibrant. But I had a mystical experience of the forms of Plato's. Uh, oh, wow. The idea of uh, Plato's concept of the idos. Profound. And, you know, in your first mystical experience is like your first girlfriend, right? Um, it's the one that has a huge impact on... Uh, what happens thereafter. And that, that combination of the profound portrayal of you know, that existential, you know, drama mm -hmm. around Socrates, that the, the sage, and then there's this platonic mystical experience, that combination of the profoundly existential and mystical um, really got me profoundly interested in Platonism. And that has stayed with me uh, uh, throughout. Now I had to go outside of Western philosophy to learn a lot of a lot and to learn a lot from, I should say, I want to give proper respect, learn a lot from, uh, Buddhism and Taoism, uh, specifically before I could return to Platonism and see more profoundly into it via the help of some important bridging thinkers like Pierre Hadot. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's one of those things, man. If I had a time machine and I could experience directly whatever was going on at Plato's Academy in terms of the actual practices, because they, yeah. they seem they seem to I mean, clearly we know later Platonists like Plotinus were were absolutely doing practices akin yep. to yeah. some kind of meditation. He doesn't exactly give a step by step, but he talks about withdrawing inward, cutting yourself off from the senses, and that sort of being the beginning of of the path of realizing your true nature and and yeah. you know ascending through the various levels of reality. But we don't know, you know, that we, we do we do there's a lot of smoke in terms of that there's probably there's there's low hanging esoteric hermeneutics you can do in a lot of the Platonic dialogues. But there's also some some more exotic ones. Yep. And and we also know that they highly prized the apophatic experience in general. And you know, yeah. Plato himself is, is quoted as as talking about how you know wonderful the the mysteries of Eleusis are, for instance. And yeah. yet another thing that we, we we don't know what they were, but but we know yeah. that that this was a way of knowing and pursuing wisdom that seemed to span every possible domain of the human experience. It was intellectually rigorous, but also hinged on direct experience. And yep. speaking of the Republic, one of the most famous, um, you know, enduring pieces from that is the, the, is the divided line. And yeah. what kind of wisdom is that at the top of the divided line? It's, it's direct wisdom of the forms. It's, it's no, no assist, right? It's this, yeah. this kind of knowing that, is far above the sensory, but it's above even like the intellectual and the, yes. and the critical thinking faculty, which I think most people would think is probably the pinnacle, but they place it above that. You know, they, they place that kind yeah. of experience you had sitting up in your bed that I'm sure at the time you had probably very little context for 
above all of that. And for me, the, those kinds of experiences that I've had, what's amazing about them is they're strangely backwards compatible with like, like they, they make new levels of sense as you learn more strangely, yes. Yes. even though you can never fully explain them. It's just like, oh, wow, that, you know, that, you know, you know who, else, like, for instance, in, in your case, you, you know, where geometry features very heavily Platonism, yeah. what's written above the, the door of Plato's Academy, let none ignorant of geometry enter here. You know, it's yes. like, yeah. yeah. So there, there's only, you know, that that's, that's something that's highly intriguing. I, I guess I, while we're talking about this, I'll pose the question to you. Why do you think it is that that's the highest form of knowledge, this like direct experience that can't even be captured by critical thinking? Well, I, I, uh, I don't, I, uh, I need to slightly alter what you're saying. And if you don't like it, please interject. But mm -hmm. the thing that people need to remember, and this is one of the things that third way neoplatonic scholarship has been emphasizing people like Gonzalez on Highland, which is the non-propositional, right? Non-propositional knowing being really, really important. And, um, and of course we're talking about confronting the non-propositional. Um, I talk about this in the four kinds of knowing. Um, we could go into that later if you'd like. But the thing to remember, which is also emphasized, is, and I, I, I wanted to, I specifically mentioned that in my mystical experience, although it is in some sense um, above the intellectual, it also reaches deeply into the ground of the sensual. The divided mm -hmm. line is still a line. There's still a continuum there that has to be remembered. And that, that was the thing that was so intriguing. Now, like many people, I was so originally intoxicated from, uh, from that view from above uh, that I thought that was the essence. But if you remember in the allegory of the cave, which is in the Republic, mm -hmm. the philosopher not only ascends to see the sun, the philosopher then descends back yeah. into the cave. And Plato takes great pains to emphasize that is as important as the ascent out right? Um, and so this is one of the new things that's happening is a reorientation to not just the ascent up, but the return back, yeah. which is in, which is properly in Neoplatonism, although it's still skewed in favor of the ascent, uh, the flight of the alone to the alone in Plotinus and that sort of right. thing. Um, and, and I think that's important if we, if we, now to answer your question, why is, why is tracing out that whole line up and down important? Uh, and why is it important that it be non-propositional is because I think what we're dealing with there are the kinds of knowing that ultimately ground our ability to make sense, to, 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 um, to participate in the intelligibility of reality. Reality yeah. makes sense to us. And that is not properly, this is part of the argument of 40 Cogside, that's not properly being done by, or yeah, properly or exclusively being done by your propositional knowing, your ability to affirm propositions. It's being even more importantly carried by your skills. If I left you with just your propositions and without your skills, you would be radically cut off from reality. Oh, yeah. yeah. And But if all you had was your skills and you didn't have the conscious ability to have to take perspectives on reality and be in perspective, perspectival knowing and be present that way. You'd even be more, you'd still be cut off from reality, right? In a profound way. And then underneath that perspectival knowing is, is knowing by being. You and the world have both been shaped by profound principles of physics and chemistry and biology and technology and society and culture. Yeah. And so you're partic and so that knowing by being and if, if that, and if I cut that off from you, um, that's like that would be like the most profound sense of loneliness and culture shock. You'd be feel radically alienated and disconnected yeah. from reality. So the argument I'm making is the non-propositional knowing really carry most of our connectedness to our realization in both senses of the word of becoming aware and making actual our realization of reality. And therefore the 
the education of them in both senses, drawing out, educe, and, you know, informing the Platonic and the Aristotelian sense of education, right? Yeah. That's what's happening in these practi- in these kinds of experiences, these kinds of practices. You're, you're, you're tracing out, right, the, I don't know what to call it, you, you're, you're tracing out the living structure of the kind of realness that is disclosed to you in the non-propositional knowing. And then the argument I've been making is that grammar of the non-propositional is profoundly, right, at one with the grammar of reality, or we're in very deep, skeptical, solipsistic trouble. And you, yeah, you've yeah. heard the more extended argument. I won't repeat it here. Um, but um, so not only does it get put us most in touch with our realization of reality, it allows us to participate in the way in which reality is realizing itself. And I think that is the most profound contact conformity with reality that we can experience. And that is profoundly meaningful to us and transformative yeah. of us. Sorry, that yeah. was a long answer. No, but not I, at I, all. Yeah. And I, and we're, we're rubbing up against this idea of transjectivity. Yes. And I would definitely like, like to return here, but there's some, there's some interesting fair in the, in both the ascent and descent, the catabasis and anabasis. And yeah, I don't know if this is true, but um, I've read that apparently the idea of the ascent originated with Plato or seems to have originated with Plato. And any kind of motif of gaining spiritual knowledge prior to that was actually a, cat- a catabasis, a going down, like a going mm. into the underworld, like gaining knowledge by going... And, and in many cases, this was literal, like this was going into doing a incubation ritual at a temple where so that you could, yeah. you know, like merge with the God in your sleep or you could, um, you know, gain wisdom uh, in your sleep or be healed in your sleep or whatever it was. And that in and of itself is interesting, but also how that's metamorphosized over time, you know, it, to broad brush it being going down is now scary going down is now like the underworld is now hell um that probably says more about human psychology than it says about any kind of ontological reality but even just on a practical level that exiting the cave and then re-entering the cave is incredibly important because the trade-off is incredible ego inflation and living out of touch with practical yeah. reality. And, and we, I mean, we see this happen, you know, how, how many people, you know, do the cliche thing of have their first mystical experience or go on their first retreat and decide they want to be a shaman now, or decide yeah. they want to be yeah. a, a monk now. And, yeah. you know, that only, only to return a few months or maybe a year later, just with their life in disarray or something. So it speaks to the fact that practically, if you're going to tread this path, you've got to be able to somehow even practically live transjectively. You, you've got to be able to balance, you know, yep. all your shit. You got to be able to to juggle the transcendent and the mundane. And man, that is hard to do. That is that that is maybe even harder to do than than just having refused the call to the hero's journey to begin with and just staying yeah. firmly planted in, in the mundane because it just, it, it, it opens such a never ending can of anagogic worms. You know? <laughs> like yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it just, you could just keep going and keep going and keep going, but it's certainly not practical. And the, it seems like the only thing that makes it practical is that strange attempt to, to, to I don't even know if merge the two is the right words, but live with knowledge of both. Yeah, I want to pick up on that. Um, I think I want to emphasize what you emphasized, that there was a tremendous enacted symbol of the going down uh, associated with ancient spirituality that we 
and you know, and there was these even these incubation and dream factories. Yeah. We only, and, but, but and you know, and Pythagoras did some kind mm-hmm. of thunderstone ceremony in a cave for twenty eight yeah. days or something like that. And so I think remembering that the way you did beautifully is really really important because we have tended to cr- to create a dualism of up is good and uh, beneath is bad. Although to be fair, we still do keep notions of profundity and a deep experience too, True. right? Uh, yeah. So that we, we 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 carry the hint. I'm not sure about Plato being the only ascent. Uh, Plato, we know, is deeply influenced by Parmenides, and in Parmenides' poem, the Chariot carries him up to yeah. the goddess. And you have Pythagoras, and Pythagoras seemed to be t- talking about a kind of soul flight, uh, sh- shamanic soul flight, yeah. um, that looks like at times like it's above rather than below but certainly plato took that that those ideas from parmenides and pythagoras and made them he articulated them and made them deeply well obviously uh i'm punning here uh on what i said about deep earlier profoundly attractive to it first of all but i do think that even if he's not the originator he is the beautifier uh but the two the two are really important so one of the uh, third way scholars that has huge influence on me, uh, Drew Highland, especially his book, uh, Finitude and Transcendence or Finite Transcendence, I always get the title wrong. Um, he makes the argument that the core of Plato is keeping, almost. I almost picture it like one hand uh, holding our finitude and another hand open to our transcendence. Because as you said, if we if we only reach for the transcendence, we will be filled with hubris, yeah, right. Uh, but if we only um, hold on to our finitude, we will drop into despair and servitude. Um, and so they act, and uh, <laughs> this is a very Vervakian thing to say, I suppose. They act like opponent processing, uh, mm-hmm. and for me, I think coming across Highland's argument that at the core of Plato was this profound kind of opponent processing between staying rooted in our finitude, but branching into our transcendence. And of course, I'm invoking the tree here. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it, I think that tonos, I like the Greek word tonos because our word tension is largely negative, mm. but tonos can be like the the tension of the bow or the lyre, it can be, it holds the opposites together, as Heraclitus said. And of course, we know that Plato is also deeply influenced by Heraclitus yeah. as well. Uh, that 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 tonos, and in 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 some ways, Highland makes the argument, which I think is right, is if when we get opponent processing right, we get an optimal grip, Marlo Ponti sense, and I think. Platonic wisdom is an optimal grip between our finitude and our transcendence. So we live the best kind of life possible for a human being while remaining human. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that that starts to get into, you know, what, what what is it really? What is it all about? And I think that's a really difficult question to answer. Like, what is Platonism? What is it all about? What is it, you know, concerned with other than the pursuit of wisdom writ large, but that seems like sort of a, like a cop-out answer. Um, and like, you know, we could obviously pull out various features and arguments that are made, but to your point, it, it like sometimes Plato, depending on like what you're reading, will downplay arguments he's already made in other places or yes. contradict himself in other places. And and this is one of the reasons why I think you do have to kind of use esoteric hermeneutics and or or you know just to put it more bluntly, kind of read between the lines that not exactly what he's saying, but what he's pointing to, you know, not not look at the finger, look at the moon sort of um, way of of reading, like try, trying to grasp the the point more generally and thematically rather than tease apart logically exactly what he's saying Mm -hmm. though he does do arguments like that sometimes too clearly um so it's it it does that sometimes make it hard to say what exactly it is and what exactly we're supposed to do but it's i'm just thinking of this now but it's almost more of a style it's almost more of a style of approaching knowledge and wisdom and Yes, there are, I think, practices that that back that. Um, but 
sometimes it's not the most clear even you know to i mean i still think i'm a complete neophyte in this topic but you know even to people like me who you know i, I think i've dove a little deeper than the average person and to me i'm still you know i'm like man i i could be getting this all wrong i you know i you know maybe they're Maybe I'm completely obsessed with elements of this that didn't even exist or he didn't even intend to exist to begin with. And then even within Platonism itself, you know, it's it's influence spanned so long that it's yes. it's hard to say, like, was Plotinus really concerned with the exact same thing Plato was? It's like, I, I don't even know. It seems like he was, but I don't know. Um, yes. And here yeah. we are still even thousands of years after Plotinus, you know, grappling with a lot of the same stuff and but but still still maintaining this thing called Platonism or still propagating this thing called Platonism as nebulous as it, as it kind of is. Um, how would you define it, John, like what Platonism is and what its primary concerns are? Well, let me address what you said in order to create sort of a platform for answering your question, what Platonism is. Um, I think what you just pointed to is a feature, not a bug. Um, (laughs) so I was, I was privileged to partake in, uh, the wisdom task force that became the paper that was released in, I think, 2021 or 2020, uh, headed by Igor Grossman, all, uh, all of the main researchers, philosophers, historians, neuroscientists, psychologists, all of them like, well, that would, that we could get to participate either physically or virtually. Um, and what, one of the things that we all converged on is that a core feature of wisdom is what what was called perspectival metacognition, your ability Mm. to like take perspectives, including perspectives on your perspective taking and on your perspective. And that this ability to be multi perspectival and to be metacognitively multi perspectival, um, is the a core ability of wisdom because it allows you to create the most multi-leveled, multidimensional capacity for self-correcting, for looking for bias, for seeing through self-deception, seeing through illusion into reality and, and getting a state of mind that can handle that complexity in a dynamic manner. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the whole point of the platonic dialogues. And, um, and, th- and this is not just my view, this is the view of a lot of people in third way Platonism, that the point of the dialogues is to train this virtue. It's not just a skill, train this virtue, because it involves altering your perspective, your state of consciousness, altering your character. It, it, it's to cultivate this virtue of this meta perspectival, uh, uh, sorry, perspectival metacognition. It would also be meta perspectival. Um, and and I, I think that's also the point of, of dialogical practice for mm-hmm. you and I to create this multi-perspectival, reflective virtue, awareness uh, that is at the core of being able to see through the very complex and multi-leveled ways in which we can fall prey to self-deception, be cut off from uh, the depths of reality. So Plato is much more interested. That's why the the, uh, the dialogues are often centered on virtues, on cultivating this virtue in you. He even seems to make the argument. I, I agree with Brickhouse, uh, and I think it's Brickhouse and Smith, that the unity of the virtues isn't just that the virtues form a system. It's something like each virtue is a way of being wise in a particular situation. It's a way of doing what I've been talking about. Mm-hmm. That seeing through and seeing into. Uh, McGee and Barber, when they did their huge review uh, on on wisdom, they said the core feature is seeing the ability to see through illusion and into reality. And that's what Plato is most concerned with. And one of the things he seems to be indicating is the two things that can cause us to fail is when we just sort of believe that our untutored common sense intuition gives us the truth. I just know it in my gut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or we just believe some propositional theory has given us the complete knowledge of something. Here's the technical definition of honesty. I read, I read it in blah, 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 blah. And, and so, and this Gonzalez makes this point, Plato's always trying to steer us between those so that, again, we are always in tonos about our finitude and our transcendence. So this virtue that I'm talking about 
is right. It's I'll, I'll use a, a, a pictorial metaphor, a visual metaphor. Like there's the tension horizontally, right? Uh, you know, sort of I'm holding my hands like between finitude and transcendence. And this yeah. gives you this ability, right, to see through illusion and, and into reality, especially non-propositionally. And I think the core of Platonism is that those two things aligned with two more, which is when you do that, when you're doing that, you have the capacity to satisfy in an integrated fashion the two most fundamental human drives. One is, you can call them meta desires. One is to be at peace within myself, not an empty peace. That's why he uses the term justice, a, a mm -hmm. fruitful inner peace. Like if I said, I'll give you unlimited sex and money and power, but you will be deeply at war within yourself. You go, well, I don't want that. <laughs> I'm not going to give up. I don't like, I don't want to be riven against myself in a profound way. Right. And then the other one is you want whatever it is that's giving you pleasure or joy, right. To be real. Right. We want to be, we have this meta desire to be in contact with reality, to be in touch. Notice the metaphors, the intimacy metaphors. We, we desire to be intimate with reality, to see through illusion. That's why you don't want to, uh, that's why people want to know if their partner is cheating on them, even if it would undermine their romantic relationship that is giving them so much joy and meaning because they right. don't want it to be fake. What Plato is saying is, Okay, well, if you can hold finitude and transcendence together and you start to see more deeply into reality, that resonates more deeply into you. You start to see more deeply into yourself. And that allows you to more align the parts of you and get that inner peace. And as that inner peace is realized, that inner conflict goes down. And that inner conflict is the source of how you project and distort and distract yourself from reality. So the two desires can be so satisfied in a mutually accelerating, or like I call it, reciprocally opening manner. And I think that reciprocal opening is what we take to be simultaneously the mark of what is happening to me is most real and the best. And that would play, that's what Plato's trying to point to with his notion of the good. So Platonism yeah. is that, all of those aligned together with one final claim, reality is also organized in this bottom-up emergence and top-down emanation. I think that becomes more clear, uh, especially in Plotinus and the post-Plotinian Neoplatonist. And you put that all together and you have this profound proposal about how human beings can find an optimal, in many of the ways in which we can be optimal, an optimal way of being. That's the proposal, I would argue, that Platonism is making. Mm. Yeah, that's that's great. That's really really well put yeah and there, there's there's so many different directions to go from there because i'm i'm tempted to get into some of the more uh metaphysical aspects but i want to stick i guess i want to stick with the practical because i think that 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 lets great. people sink their teeth into why this really matters and what why the staying power is it is what it is not not just from a a philosophical intellectual standpoint but a practical standpoint um, yes i, I think that's what, correct what, let's go there the th yeah let's do it let's do it what one of the the ways i mean just again like just to walk this back to um the very beginning is there there's a there's a core perspective that socrates occupies that is very, very easy to place yourself into. And it's that sort of atopic um, point of view that something is off here. Something mm -hmm. about reality, the world I'm living in, um, the things I'm supposed to care about. I just, it doesn't feel like, it. like nothing, mm -hmm. none of this low-hanging fruit, none of these easy paths for me to take really feel quite right. They don't really feel quite satisfying. And they always just like anything I try just feels kind of empty. And then I'm like back to square one after I've, you know, satisfied my desire or I've learned whatever the thing is. And not only that, but then this core 
you know, the, the, the thing that's probably associated with Socrates more than anything else, this statement that he knows that he doesn't know anything. Mm -hmm. And I think in our heart of hearts, underneath all of our, you know, identity and, and ways we, we commonly exoterically interact with the world through the ego and the persona, I think we all kind of feel that way. And we're all waiting for the thing that feels real. Mm -hmm. And though we, that thing is elusive, you could always return to that, to that point of view, that, that feeling of a topos of out of placeness. And that may sound like a weird kind of, I don't know, Taoist way of, of approaching uh -huh. knowledge of, of, of knowing something by knowing that you don't know something. It really, there, there's a lot to that. There, there's a lot of power in in just knowing that you don't know anything. So much power that he basically destabilized Athens by, by by just walking around proving that not only do I not know anything, you person who claims they don't have wisdom don't know anything either. And it rubbed people the wrong way pretty badly, to, to put it to put it mildly. So 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 badly that he that he died for it and that to me was one of the things for sure that initially drew drew me to Platonism is who's the guy they celebrate most? The guy who knew that he didn't know anything? Like that's that's actually badass. Yeah. That's that's really cool. Yeah. Um and, and and of course, you know, his his wisdom extends beyond that, but just starting there at least makes sense because it's not, you know, it's uh, that that's another thing with a lot of these, especially the the popular ways of approaching spirituality is, is they almost all start with you just prostrating yourself to something higher than you, just because it's higher than you supposedly don't ask mm -hmm. questions, do these practices. And that's what spirituality is. And I think that that's insulting to any thinking person who, who wants something more and where, where better to start than that, than, than, Hey, this guy seems to agree with me that he doesn't know anything <laughs> and, and he's, and he's spiritually and, and philosophically listless. And then from there, you get to go on this ride of exploring so many ideas, um, with that being the sort of underpinning and that in and of itself is, is very useful to sort of destroy, like destroying any, cause it really started, sort of destroys that there is any wisdom to begin with. And that is so helpful. Like just, just attaching yourself from like, let's just wipe the slate clean and just start, start talking mm -hmm. about ideas and, you know, occupy different perspectives throughout the exploration of those ideas. And then everything sort of, sort of follows from there. Um, and man, I, I can't think of any other philosophies that that operate that way, at least not now. So, um, wow, there's there's a lot there and I want to reply to it. Um, so I think Plato is portraying Socrates as the hero of the tonos between finitude and transcendence. Um, Socrates seems to reliably be steering away from hubris. Um, but also reliably demonstrating profound existential courage. And he doesn't fall into despair, even when confronted uh, with failure, Alcibiades, or death when he's in prison. Um, and so that is Plato trying to say there's something going on there. Um, you're right. Socrates claims to not know. We have to, we have to, we have to caveat that because there's many things he claims to know. Mm -hmm. But these are not sort of propositional knowings. These are existential, non-propositional knowing. He knows the unexamined life is not worth living. He knows the best kind of life is in the midst of dialogos. He knows what to care about. He knows ta erotica. He knows how to love well, right? He so and he he knows that virtue is essential to a good life. There's many things that Socrates does know, but he's ignorant of any capacity to give a definitional closure on them. There's no propositional way of grasping. What he's on about is entering into that tonic, tonos, right mm -hmm. relationship uh, to reality, to virtue. Um, but 
once all that is said, um, and the, neo the Neoplatonic tradition makes that clear, is what you're actually doing then is you're you're doing this trying not to try. You're doing this cultivation. Cultivation metaphors are frequently used, right? You're, you're cultivating the soil so it can best receive the seed that is not found in the soil, but, yeah. well, right? And so from which, you know, the tree of wisdom will grow. And you have all these metaphors and the, these cultivation and this notion of cultivating a profound receptivity um, becomes central um, in Neoplatonism. Um, and, and you're right, that aligns very significantly with aspects of Taoism and Zen, because of course, Taoism goes into Zen as well. Mm -hmm. this, cult, this cultivating of a profound receptivity um, in which you have to have a learned ignorance. You have to, um, this is Nicholas of Cusa, you have to come to the place where you have seen through all of your knowledge and, all, and seen through the distortions and you open yourself beyond that place, not before yeah. it, because if you do it before it, all of that machinery and all of its in inherent bias and distortion will not give you, you'll be hard soil, but you have to break all that up, right? And make the soil receptive for the, the to the seed yeah, of reality. Yeah, because yeah. Reality has to, if reality isn't showing up on its own account, it's not reality. It's you. Right. Right. And so you get this learned ignorance, this profound receptivity. All of wisdom begins in wonder. Right. This profound right. opening. Right. That um, that is, is is essential. And I do think you see it in Taoism and also at the at, in the heart of Zen, this trying not to try this doing this sitting. But it's but it's not doing nothing, but it is doing nothing. Right. I do think that. This is why my next series is uh, Walking the Philosophical Silk Road about trying to get uh, the two these two great synoptic integrations, Neoplatonism, which is the spiritual backbone of the West, and Zen, which represents sort of one of the most comprehensive uh, integration, you know, Taoism, Buddhism, elements of Shinto, right? Uh, get yeah. them to deeply talk to each other as much as possible about how can we most profoundly cultivate this receptivity, which is found in that tonos. There's a deep connection between being in that tonos, between your humanity and your openness to transcendence, right? That receptivity so that reality can place a seed. And then, of course, this is taken up by Eckhart, right? Eckhart's hmm. idea that you have to somehow cultivate the manger within you so that yeah. the Logos, the Son of God, can be born again. Now, we translated born again into this I think really bad, trivial, emotional sort of cataclysm that a person has or something like that. Yeah, and that's yeah, not yeah. what's, that's not what's being talked about. But if you'll allow me to, to, if, if I ask people to rehear it, Platonism, it, yeah, this learned ignorance is the receptivity that allows you to be born again by making you receptive um, to the deepest seeding from reality. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I love that metaphor of having to break up the soil so that you're ready to receive the seed. Um, that's that's so huge, and that points to so many things. I mean that that even that even gets back to. I mean, I don't I don't know if I want to diverge here, but that that gets into bullshit a little bit too. You know, yes. from, in, yeah. in the way that you talk about it, in that to stretch this metaphor into let's say someone you're arguing with. What condition is their soil in? Is it yeah, is there yeah. is there is there soil in the condition in which they want to receive the the seed of wisdom that runs counter to whatever they're talking about, or are they more interested in preserving whatever it is they're arguing? Like if that's the case, they're more interested in bullshit than they're interested in whatever the truth is. Yes. Like they're not interested in actually having fertile enough soil to to change their mind or even participate in dialogos in the way that it's in, intended to be and in that we're trying to to mutually explore ideas here and and see yeah. if that something emerges um yes yeah well said i think i think uh i think socrates has a quote or plato has a quote to the effect of truth only exists when when two minds collide together like flint and create a spark or something. It's something to that yeah. effect. You know, it's like, yeah. it's yeah. like to, to try to talk about the one, the truth, you really can't do it, but you can, you can get a glimpse of it. You can get a glimpse of yes. it when, when multiple minds come together 
in search of something. And that that's such a beautiful idea. Um, but yeah, and, and it also speaks to why, why some of this wisdom needs to be distributed in such a way that it appears esoteric from the outside looking in. Because if yeah. you, you know, it's pearls before swine, it's yes. some, some, you know, if, if you're a, if you're Plato or, or any yourself, John, if, so, if somebody walks up to you and they're like, give me your, give me your deepest truths, John. And, and they don't, they, they don't have the requisite foundation of ideas. Their soil's not in the condition to, to receive your, your full, the full download from you. And th- there's something sexy about it for sure. About like, oh yes, I want to be initiated. I want to go through the, the grades of wisdom. I want to till my yeah. soil to, to be more receptive to wisdom. But when it, when it comes to the practicals of it, I mean, you and I can see it, right? Like look, look at the views on uh, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis episode one, and then look at the views on the last one. Like not many people stick all the way through. Like they claim to want to know. They claim, oh, this is really important. I'm I'm ready. And then at some point they stop showing up. And you know, you you can't you can't get to the last port part if you if you skip around or if you stop. Um and I think that speaks to why Plato was esoteric and 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 why his there clearly were secret teachings that are alluded to um, you know, by later Platonists too that we've We've now lost, and I think there have even been some fragments found uh, that point to some of this stuff. And I mean, man, the Republic is just a repository of esoteric knowledge. I'm, I, I'm sure you're aware of the. Um, there's published work now on some of the the hidden um, features of the Republic, like um, like there's clearly uh, Pythagorean structuring in terms yep. of uh, like tonality that run. Yes. Yeah. Through the through the book, or through notice the, your through the invocation. Work. Of, notice your invocation of Tonos, by the way. Yeah, right, and unintentional, but yeah, con- yeah, convenient, conveniently unintentional. So yes, so much, so much good stuff there about about actually being in a position to receive the knowledge rather than just you know claiming to want the knowledge. But I'm a uh, I'm spinning in circles here, forgetting what my what my initial point was. But well, can I make one point? Yeah, of course. From these yeah. circles. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm very. Oh, I, I think it's very clear that there's stuff going on um, outside of the the dialogues. But um, I'm not of the opinion of some people in the esoteric tradition who say the dialogues are irrelevant or a cover story oh, or yeah, distraction. Yeah. I, I don't hold that. I do think that there's stuff going on. Plato indicates that in the seventh letter, and that you ultimately have to sort of live with somebody a long time, and the spark has to catch. So there's stuff that's going on in the Platonic community of the Academy that was integral to people uh, learning Platonism that is mm-hmm. not captured by just reading the the dialogue. So I've been engaged with a lot of good people um, of good faith in trying to reverse engineer, not recover. Notice the difference. I'm not claiming this is what they were doing in the academy, but to try and reverse engineer practices, an ecology of practices, so people can come and you know, be in community, commune with each other uh, in these practices, uh, because I think that person-to-person relationship is very, very important to Platonism. But yeah, the, the only when we are circumambulating together around reality do we start to get an idea. But Plato also said, the best mirror of me is to look into your eyes as yeah. you're beholding me. Right, and so all of this is also why we are we, we're, we're trying to. How do you come up with an ecology of practices? How do you situate it properly within a dialogical uh, a community? Uh, because all of that, um, well, all of that stuff that's not carried in the dialogue, but was carried by the community. We need to reverse engineer something like that for our time, uh, in order to deeply make. Uh, Platonism, a living tradition again, and not just some cool ideas that people yeah. like to think about because it gives them a little bit of a, a mental orgasm or something like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and now I remember where um, where I, I took the exit and, and started driving in circles. And it was on the way to the point that I was being a little bit coy before when I said, I, I don't really have an opinion or or know what Platonism is about. And 
if I'm honest, I really think it's about what you were pointing to a few minutes ago, which is which is rebirth, like this yeah. this idea of the second birth. And not only do I think Platonism is about that, I think really everything throughout the perennial philosophy is is pointing to this idea that within this life, you can wake up to a greater nature that is 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 very real here both yes. here and now and and I mean it seems like Platonism is arguing that after um in, in some in some way and you know you can you can sort of see this in Socrates's candor before death you know he he kind of knows there's more going on though he's sort of waffling and not sure what happens after you die but then he says some you know then he says some weird esoteric stuff about earth being a dodecahedron <laughs> like whatever yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh but you know like look into a lot of these other you know ways of thinking that there are yeah there are some important metaphysical disagreements but they're they're essentially laying out the exact same equation for you you know there's a um in the corpus hermeticum there's a a whole um tract about um being reborn into noose which is a, it's like the exact yeah. language of the of the the platonists i mean the totally although there are real again really important metaphysical disagreements between gnosticism and platonism yeah we're trying to get you to, the whole yeah right sorry. against yeah. against the gnostics yeah and yeah. However, they, you know, they, they were trying to get you to, again, wake up to the quote unquote greater reality and that you, you, ex you know, the, the, so the whole Neo matrix proposition essentially. And I would argue that that's largely what it's you saying circ circumambulating made me think this, but I think that's largely the effort in Jung's individuation as well as oh, yeah. to, is to Jung awaken to your, your deeper nature. And man, when you read seven sermons to the dead where the idea of individuation even came from you're confronted with a extraordinarily esoteric picture of of what your true nature is or can be um that that goes beyond what he published i think in his lifetime you had to wait until you know yeah he was however he was many ahead of his time. Yeah, like however many years after his death to even get a copy of the Red Book. I think it was like 2008 or something that it originally published. Um, so I, I really think throughout the ages, there is this realization that, you know, like let's let's dispense with all of the, the metaphysical sharp edges and, and, you know, different language used. And just focus on the fact that everybody seemed to believe or or think it was worthwhile to go on this labyrinthian journey of self-discovery and, and not just for mental health or not just for feeling better, but because it actually ontologically meant something. Like it meant something for yes. your actual existence and if you failed to do it, you were you were kind of missing out on the 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 whole project of you know to to sound like I'm making an essentialist argument or something like you're you're kind of missing out on what it really means to grow the seed that is the human. So there's a lot there, it's, and uh, I think you know the 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 Neoplatonic and even in the Stoic tradition, um, I think it's even part of the whole Hellenistic. Uh, tr transformation of the cultivation of wisdom in the Hellenistic period. But this metaphor, uh, these two metaphors, the philosopher is the physician of the soul. There's a mm. kind of healing, but it's not healing. To, it's a healing that returns you to normal and then heals you beyond the normal. Mm. Um, and then as the child is to the adult, the adult is to the sage. That the yeah. way you have matured, and I, I agree with John Rusin, that the core thing we're pointing to when we're talking about somebody being mature is the ability to face reality. That's yeah. deep mark of maturity. And of course, we are moving into an age of rampant immaturity, uh, which is not good. Um, and so I think that's right. What I would say is there is something about uh, 
becoming more mature in this deeper sense, platonic sense, the rebirth sense of mature uh, is, is, goes back primordial. It's probably pre present in shamanism. Right. Um, um, and, and I want to make something very clear, and I'm not attributing anything to you. I think what one of the dangers is that can be sucked into a narcissism that the point of this uh, is me to, for yeah. me to be reborn kind of a butterfly metaphor. So I'm all beautiful and everybody will look at me. The point of the rebirth, you know, and this comes out in Jesus of Nazareth, the point of the rebirth is so that you can see, participate, belong to the kingdom of God. It's yeah. when you're reborn, you see the world, you face reality, you know, and, and reality faces you in a way that was not available to you before. The point, that's the point of this. The point is to live in a deeper world, live in a more real, real. David Yaden's work shows that when people confront the really real, when we, we when they have those experiences, like we were talking about at the beginning, they will transform their lives, their identity, their relationship, because they want to be in more continuous contact with that really real. Um, I think often what we mean Sorry, one of the things I don't want to be too, 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 too overbearing here. When we when we're invoking God, what we're trying to say is we have found a sacredness for the ultimate, for the really real. We are loving the really real, and that's something than just having an, an idea like in physics or even an appreciation of the really real. We've come into that. I'm conforming myself to it, being transformed to it. I am reciprocally opening to it. It is opening up as I am opening up. We are opening up together. There's a loving going on. And this is very clear in Plato. Read this symposium. And mm -hmm. so being born again is also the rebirth of the world. That's why the Christian notion of being born in Christ was always tied to the apocalypse, which doesn't mean the ending. It means the revelation or disclosure of the real world that has been plastered over by illusion and fraud and sin and vice. And so the idea is you are not only cracked open like the seed, right? The world becomes available to you. The sun shines into the plant that grows in a way it couldn't shine into the soil, right? Or like I always have a frog for Neoplatonism nearby, right? Because a frog, this is, you start in one world, the watery world, and oh, you cool. make, make the way to, right, the land world, but... You're an amphibian. You still return and know how to live in the watery world. It's just a beautiful, really yeah. a beautiful metaphor. Uh, and so I, I agree with everything, and I, I wasn't attributing this to you. Um, and I, I, I want to make this this idea that you can get you can get you have to get to this point where the self it, the self is fully involved, but this is not a self involved project. Right, 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 right. You're involving the whole of the self. It's rebirth, not just a new idea, but that, that rebirth is also the apocalypse, the, the disclosure of a deeper reality that calls you in love into a deeper and deeper relationship. Think about it. When you love somebody, you have that ongoing receptivity to the reciprocal opening between you and the other person. The reason I bring this up is I think you're some, there's something right about um, calling Jung, uh, I don't know which to call him, a Gnostic Neoplatonist or a Neoplatonist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gnostic. I He's agree. The, yeah. Yeah. Um, and... I think people need to pay attention to all of Jung's corpus. There is an emphasis on the the beginning to the middle of Jung, which is very and Kant, I'm sorry, Jung is explicit about this. is very Kantian. This is all sort of inside the purely mm -hmm. subjective world, and it's very self-referential, even though the ego is being transcended into the self. But as you move into the later work, he, you know the idea of the schizoid and other stuff. I'm not totally in agreement with any of his metaphysical arguments, but I see him reaching to try to say, wait, if this doesn't ultimately connect to the grammar of reality, this is very dangerous solipsism. This is very dangerous, mm -hmm. uh, you know, narcissism, training in narcissism. And so I just wanted to bring that point. I recommend people like, and if you're going to secondary sources on Jung, look at people who are looking at Jung as a whole and the entire progression yeah right? Because that rebirth is the rebirth of the world and you together. Yes, yes. that's so, that's well, so said. well said. Um, um, I just I am just working on this 
pretty pretty lengthy uh, video on individuation right now, and I've been um, using the work of Murray Stein quite a bit because in his collected works, he really pretty thoroughly approaches this concept of individuation from multiple angles. And he has a great riff on why individuation and individualism are not the same thing. Yes. And and yes. why the project of individuation is like, yes, of course the ego is involved in it. Of course the persona is involved in it. But the whole point of it is to see them for what they are as just these little, you know, features that are they're like bobbing on the ocean, essentially, that that is the deeper psyche get underneath them and and not just get underneath them, but not allow yourself, whatever you are, to ever be fully captured by any of the forces that you encounter, like any of these big archetypal forces that will, yes, yeah. uh, you know, like, af like he points out after you um, break apart the persona, one of the very first things that happens is some kind of archetypal temptation rises to the surface. And you can, yeah. you can see this in the midlife crisis, right? Like, I don't want to be this thing anymore. I'm going to um, cast this aside, this old relationship, this old job, whatever it is, and I'm going to do this new thing. And then you get possessed yeah. by some new archetypal force that wants to give you a new uh, persona yeah. to wear that's like this archetypally charged persona. And that's not individuation either. It's it's going through that whole uh, chapel perilous of, you know, uh, whatever the psyche is and still holding on to your individuality now contextualized by the whole Mysterium Tremendum and um, and the Mysterium Fascinosum, like both the terrible and the, the beautiful, and then coming out the other side. And then that ends up culminating in like this, you know, that, that famous interview that Jung had toward the end of his life where he's asked about if he believes in God and he just smiles and says, I don't believe I know. Yeah, I know. And uh, um, there's a letter he wrote. I think there he is yeah, yeah. referring to non-propositional knowing. I think that's what he's oh, yeah. referring to. Oh, yes, yes, yes. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And he actually writes a letter um, to uh, the BBC publication, The Listener, to clarify what he meant by that statement. And, and that that is what he meant. He he didn't say, I don't, I, I'm not saying I believe in a particular God. I'm not saying I believe in the God of this religion or the God of that religion. I'm saying I've been confronted by so much more than I will ever be able to mm -hmm. explain or understand or put words around. Um, yeah, sorry for the ramble, but... Um, no, well, can I ask you one question? Could I course. ask? Or it's a request. It's not even a question. Could you tell me the author uh, that was writing that uh, very good work on individuation? Oh, um, Murray Stein. Murray Stein. Um, and it's in his... He has a collected works... Um, he's a Jungian analyst. Um, I, he's in his eighties now, I think, but, um, yeah, you can, you can purchase his collected works both in, um, some of it I think is available in audio. It's broken up into different parts, but one of them I don't is, like audio. I would, I would <laughs> yeah, like, no. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like, I actually like going between both. Um, oh, good. But, um, but yeah, I like to it's sort of like I like to listen to things and be like, okay, this needs a deeper dive. And I like, I need the text for this and I need to, to go back. Um, the person I've read on that is John Dooley. Um, and mm. Dooley does a lot, especially in his book, Psyche is Sacrament in comparing a uh, Jung and Tillich on this. Uh -huh. And one of the things I found valuable in Tillich is Tillich explicates the tonos again. I got this notion of tonos ultimately from Tillich. Uh, between individuation and participation and that what we, we constantly we we can look and this goes back to the platonic thing we 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 can get lost in either one we can do the in, we can get sort of caught up in individuation and lose the degree to which we are participating in something greater than ourselves but mm -hmm. when we participate like you said in the archetypal things we can lose ourselves in it in a in a deleterious sense and Tillich was about the the wise person doesn't try and resolve the tonos. The wise person tries to find the optimal grip out of the... The wise person doesn't re see the tonos as a contradiction. The wise person is able to frame it as opponent processing and find an optimal grip therein. Um, and and uh, so I thought Durley's work was really, really helpful for that. 
uh, and he puts Jung and Tillich in this great conversation around it. It sounds like it would go very well with Stein. Very nice. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it would. I'm sure it would. And and I love too this this notion like um Hillman really focuses on this idea of deepening it's kind of interesting because Anna, Anna, you know, Anna Gage is kind of like yeah. cli climbing into infinity and yeah. Hillman brings up a similar idea, um, James Hillman of like yes. deepening, deepening into yes. infinity. It's just yes. like you, yeah. you can never, never go deep enough. And and I think he's relying a lot on Heraclitus for that. I don't remember which fragment specifically, but I know there's some fragment of Heraclitus where he's talking about um, growing roots into reality or, or going deeper into reality. And I know he also talks about the the famous, you know, nature loves to hide yeah. um, sort of, you know, I, I think that's sort of a bastardized translation of what he's actually saying. But um, yes. nonetheless, it's very, very, very interesting. That That's one I would love to ask you about, because I do think it. It does fold into everything we're talking about, but it that really comes off koan, koan like and that really comes off. Also, Zen, I would say this idea of nature loving to hide. That comes from um, one of the Her Heraclitus fragments. Um, yeah. What, well, what do yeah, you I'd like to comment yeah, yeah. on that. Yeah, so, uh, um, Polanyi has been helpful, but I think it also lines Michael Polanyi's work. Esther Lightcap Beek has a book called Contact with Reality that really brings this out. And Polanyi made this explicit, but I also see this at least very close to the surface implicit in, uh, in Plato. And also, you see it in Heidegger. And this is the notion that we experience something as real when it's an um, when we find it has inexhaustible intelligibility for us. When mm. we when when we can keep learning more. So the shadow doesn't like I sort of can get all of what a shadow is, right? Um, at least in one sense, compared to the object. I'm thinking of Plato's cave analogy, of course, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and the objects, they they are they are they are they are they are deeper and ongoing wellsprings of like uh, of of intelligibility. Like like so compared to the shadow of the urn, I can learn so much about the urn, right? And then compared to this these objects, there's the world above. Uh, and, and I can learn so much about that. And then, of course, behind that is the source of all of this, which is a fount, an inexhaustible fount of light, of intelligibility and life, right? And light, intelligibility means both life and light, right? Um, and so we, we, we feel that we are realizing reality when we come into what is has this inexhaustible intelligibility. That's why when you're deeply, profoundly in love with a person, um, they become more and more real to you because you start to realize that if you ever think you've got them, you have not been in love with them because they will always, right? They always have depths and they always have a growth beyond your ability to sound, beyond your ability to foresee. And so... You are, they become real to you precisely because they are always, they are simultaneously shining into you and you, wow, that's amazing about you. And they're always withdrawing. I think that's what nature loves to hide because it's, oh. it's more like nature lets itself be seen coyly and then, and then it draws us in deeper and then it withdraw and we, and we keep going deeper and deeper into the forest of reality. Um, okay. And so I think that that is a profound feature of reality. And Polanyi makes that the case in uh, Light Cap Meat in her book, Light, Light Cap Meat, uh, Contact with Reality. She says that's the central claim. And I think that's some, uh, something fundamentally right. Now, what Plato adds that I don't see as clearly in Polanyi, but I think uh, uh, Light Cap Meat is trying to bring out, is that that explicitly she's trying to bring it out. When we properly realize that, not as an idea, but as you know, a rebirth, when we really realize in that way this aspect of reality, we fall in love with it because our sense of the sacred, and this is something I'm proposing. I'm pr pr proposing trying to recover the notion of the sacred as the capacity to fall in love that about reality that makes us fall in love with it so that we realize in rebirth 
its inexhaustibleness. It's an mm. inexhaustible fount of intelligibility, and that acts as an arrow pointing us to this source. The yeah. Tao is a well that can never be used up, that can never yeah. be run dry. That notion of reality. And I think that capacity to fall in love with it is uh, also something that Plato was deeply, deeply, constantly trying to get people to see, constantly trying to get people to see. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I th it also this also reminds me that this notion of nature loving to hide. I mean, Girdle's incompleteness theorem. Um, yes. You, you, like, no matter what you solve, you, it's the implication that there's so much more that you didn't solve or you didn't even propose or you didn't even know. And yeah. We're, we're, yeah. Well, the, the 20th century has been the century of learned ignorance, mm -hmm. um, which hasn't been properly taken into spirituality. It's been taken in by woo but not by proper spirituality. Godel's incompleteness theorem, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, the fact that you can, there's no computational way to go from a weaker logic to a stronger logic, yeah, the yeah. fact that there is no final resolution to the bias-variance trade-off in all of our predictions. Like the, We are discovering these intrinsic trade-off relations and self-limitation relations. So we're, we, we, the Cartesian view that we can find a universal method that will conquer all of reality and disclose all of its information, that has been undermined. That is an impossible project. And, I, and, I, and for me, and this is perhaps where I stand against um, at least standard readings of Platonism, I think we should give up the notion of sacredness as perfection, where perfection means completeness. Um, mm. I don't think... Um, that is, um, now that's not necessarily the case. There's aspects that seem to have been preserved in Eastern Orthodox Neoplatonism, especially the notion of epictasis, where the point is not to come to a final rest in God, sort of a permanent vacation. But this point is that God is the affording field of ongoing, infinite self-transcendence that infinitely discloses the inexhaustible depths Wow. of ultimate reality. And that's a very different idea, yeah. right, than sort of completion, final rest. Um, and I think that is something that um, I would like to emphasize. There has been a strand of Platonism that seeks, right, to understand the sacred in terms of perfection and understand perfection in terms of completeness and uh, a complete absence of the affordance of change or anything like that. And I think that is a profoundly just looking up view of Platonism and not enough of looking down view of Platonism. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think you're safe in doing that, John, and still being able to use the word Platonist, because even amongst Platonists, there's so much disagreement on what the yes. ultimate fate of a human being is. I mean, if you go back to Plato... You know, obviously, another one of the most famous mythos in the Republic is, um, you know, the myth of Ur and this like yeah, being yeah. stuck in these continuous cycles of of being reborn. But again, like how much of that is purely myth and how much of it is is actually meant to talk about the metaphysical reality of what a human soul is. There's huge disagreement between like Plotinus and Iamblichus about yes, what a human yes. soul is capable of. Like to Iamblichus, you're just, you're, you're actually stuck in a, in a lower slice of reality and the human soul cannot penetrate into the noetic complete realm. And you, that you can do better and you can become sort of like a platonic bodhisattva according to Iamblichus and like maintain some level of, wisdom and come into life in like a better circumstance so that you can continue teaching the true philosophy to other people, but you can't get out of it. Like there's no, there's no getting out of it. And then there's this crazy story. Have you ever heard this? Um, it's a, it's a story of cosmic ascent by, um, um, I'm drawing a, a blank on which Platonist it is now. It's a uh, Plutarch. It's Plutarch. He, yes. He talks about like I won't go into the whole story, but it's 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 kind of similar to the myth of Ur, where it's a guy who basically has an NDE. Um, his soul leaves his body, and he sees the uh, like the planet and the solar system in its true form, and he sees the like the sort of 
quintessence and archetypal nature of each yeah, planetary yeah. body and the moon and all of this stuff. And um, he starts talking to his daimon. And um, long story short, he he's told that there's this whole process that occurs when you die and that actually you get to become a daimon next if you did it, yes. if you did it right. And then you get to guide other people. And then there's yeah. more after that, like after you're a daimon, you get to, you know, so I, I, long story short, I think it's safe to say that you can, you can, you can fudge the numbers or, or play with some of these ideas and, and still uh, maintain the, the Platonistic moniker, if that even matters to you. Yeah. I, and I do. And I, um, I, I tend to read any kind of post-biological existence as purely mythological because I'm deeply commo committed to 4E cog psi. The cognition requires, it's, a, it's not happenstance, it requires embodiment, in, requires embeddedness, requires inaction, requires extendedness through other people, and that any severance from those things would be a severance from the proper uh, constitutive powers, the fundamental principles and processes of cognition. Um, and so I think um, this is another area where I stand against at least some of the traditions of Platonism um, in which there is a post-biological existence. There's some aspect of us that um, can float free of the body. Mm -hmm. It's it's unclear how, again, literal that's supposed to be taken. Obviously, some Platonists took it very literally. Uh, other Platonists seem to take it especially those influenced by stoicism, they're more sort of open to, well, maybe, maybe we just disappear, but that's okay. Right. And, and, you know, because they really constant, the stoics seem to be really concerned with real death. Like, yeah. like really, really confront your mortality. You really, really are mortal. Like, um, but the, then, the, but there's yeah. hints in sto stoicism that they might've thought of a post biological existence. Um, that's another thing, I guess. I, I, and part of this, I have to confess, is my own idiosyncratic bias. So I, I please take that into account, anybody who's listening. But I do think there I can make independent arguments that I do not un, I do not want to understand. I challenge the sacredness as basically a way of getting sort of metaphysical fire insurance so you can uh, experience mm -hmm. perpetual vacation, which is sort of the model I was brought up with in fundamentalism. The point of all of this is so I don't go to hell so I can go to heaven and just be on perpetual vacation. And um, I think that is one of the most narcissistic proposals mm -hmm. I have actually ever heard. Um, uh, but it is wrapped up and disguised by what looks like a complete sort of self-negation um, in relationship to Jesus. Now, I have to say that that doesn't mean that I'll, everybody that I met with in fundamentalist Christianity was fall I'll pray to that. Um, I'm not claiming that. In fact, I was fortunate that some of my aunts and uncles and cousins within that extended family of fundamentalist Christianity represented good lives to me. Uh, I think I would say, they would say because of their fundamentalist Christianity, I would say in spite of it. Hmm. Um, but that I say that with love and affection. But yeah. there is this general thing, and it's very prevalent in certain kinds of Christianity in the United States, where the point of Christianity is metaphysical fire insurance so that you have a free ticket to perpetual vacation. And right. for me, that is just narcissism projected into the vacuum of mystery that surrounds death. And I think the, I've seen a lot of fundamentalists who desperately try to propose that to cover up a barely covered up anxiety in the face of their mortality that is not being properly recognized. I think Plato is right that all of philosophy is a preparation for death. And in that sense, really facing... See, mortality is an issue for us precisely because we are finite transcendents. We are finite like the other animals and we will die. But unlike the other animals, we know that we're going to die. We have a sense of our mortality and we can reflect upon it and turn that reflection into a motivating affordance for the cultivation of wisdom and virtue. And so I think um, that's another area where I do, tr I do challenge a lot of more traditional strands of Neoplatonism. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean we're we're already rubbing up at the end of our time here, but there there's so many other directions I I want to go with you because it it does start to like 
one of the things I loved about your your argument that you gave uh, on you know neo neoplatonism and the path of tra path of transcendence is that what that video yeah the called? talk I gave at the Consilience Conference run by my good friend Greg Enriquez whose work is very important too by the way I, I'm not but really familiar with this work um, but I'll have to look well, into uh, it yeah please do please do but um what something I I think you put together an amazing argument on why. <laughs> the general picture that Neoplatonism is proposing is indispensable not only for personal meaning making, but is actually required to have a reality that makes sense. And along the way, you destroy, I, I think you do a great job of, of destroying reductionism. Um, yeah. One argument in particular I, I really like, but again, I know we're getting close to the end of time here. I, I don't even think I can pose this to you in the amount of time we have left, but it all hinges on this on, on this idea of this tonos that you're talking about that both emergence yeah. and transcendence um the transcendent oneness um emanationism exist together like yes are required to exist together and you can't separate one out from the other that's right and and one of the other parts of your argument though is that this all fits within an extended naturalistic argument meaning yes. like there's nothing necessarily metaphysical or spiritual here, you just have to wrap your mind around the idea that these are features of naturalistic reality. But but it's I, I think one of the things it's hard for me to do intellectually is remove whatever that emanating principle is from something that's beyond the reach ultimately of science and like beyond the reach of uh sure. something well, something i can prove uh, i mean i could prove it like inductively maybe or i could um i might be able to write right or or like I, yeah i could uh um you know like in the same way i can sort of inductively be like i i think it's i think uh eidos exists or i think uh Plata yes. um uh jungian archetypes exist or something um but I, I think, I think I, that's properly abductive inference, by the way, not inductive. Like you're, it's inference to the best explanation kind of thing. Okay. But go okay. ahead. Yeah, no, I think that 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 was my point is, or or my question is, can you naturalistically, or or how how do you naturalistically conceive of what it is that's emanating, other than like you can see the effect of it? Like I can. Um, walk back that it must logically exist but how how does that piece of it that's that's a piece of it that i couldn't understand is how how is that whatever it is that's emanating the one or um yeah. the the first cause or whatever makes things animates or uh exist is fits within that so i mean part of the argument um i would make uh, so first of all just so people are clear, extended naturalism is the proposal that we have to derive our view of reality, our ontology, not only from what is derivable from our natural sciences, but what is also presupposed by our natural sciences, like mm -hmm. the intelligibility of the universe, the reality of the level at which science is being done. I won't repeat the arguments, but that's that the idea is. And then once you are talking about what is presupposed, you're getting into uh, this the, the the this this directionality towards um, the the source the emanation. But I mean, here's where Erigena is important. I think it's not only the mystery above us, but also the mystery below us. What it all yeah. what it is all emerging from, uh, right? Um, and I would point out to you that science physics, which must if there's anything that is supposed to be the representative of naturalism, it's got to be physics. And we've already talked about how physics is bumping up against the fact that there are aspects of reality that are properly not knowable. Oh, yeah. Right? Right? But nevertheless, we can know that they're there unknowably. Um, and then once you understand that, you have to say, okay, what is our relationship to that? Do we... One of the temptations we do is we can go supernatural, where supernatural doesn't mean what it originally means in something like Dionysus, which just means sort of above nature, into a two worlds idea, 
Well, that, whatever it is above, is actually another world filled with other things, and they're just super shiny other things, Mm -hmm. and my job is to get to that other world. And I would put it to you that that is precisely the profound mistake we can get into. Um, and, And I think Filler's book, which is just a profound book on Neoplatonism, Heidegger, and the history of being, he argues that, and this lands up with Sunday and others, uh, his book on the Parmenides, that especially what Plato's trying to get us to do is to realize, and this this converges with Taoism and Buddhism, not identical, but converges, you know, that whatever we're talking about is we're talking about something that is properly no thing at all. It's mm-hmm. not a secret thing. It's not a ghostly thing. It's not a super special thing. It's not a supreme thing. Right. And these are all the temptations we can fall prey to. Um, It is no kind of thing at all. And to give a sense of something pointing to that, think about the no thingness of E equals MC squared. Where is that? Well, it's the the right answer. And you sound like you're saying things is Zen. The right answer is it's everywhere and nowhere. It's nowhere in that it's not happening, but it's everywhere in that it's constraining what's possible to happen. Now, it's not yeah. a thing, precisely because it's nowhere and everywhere. And it's not actual in that it's not acting, but it's real because it's really constraining possibility. And this is where the w- work of Alicia Urrero has had a huge impact on me. This is how I think of that which is being presupposed by physics. Like Physics presupposes the reality of laws, and the laws are not the same thing as just inductive descriptions of what has happened. They make predictions of what could happen. The, the technical language of philosophy is their counterfactual sustaining, right? They're, 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 they're trying to point at something in reality that has not been fully actualized and yeah. can never be fully actualized, right. right? And so thinking that's, again, the inexhaustibleness, the inexhaustible source of intelligibility that is not itself ever directly intelligible. But mm-hmm. for me... I think the besetting idolatry, and I'm trying to be provocative here, is we are tempted to think of that as another world, another thing, a supreme being, a super thing, a super substance. And all of those are to try and transplant and foist onto this how the everyday world appears to us, which is precisely to engage in a profound kind of category mistake that we are tempted to. And we are doing something like, this is like Wittgensteinian thing, where it's like we're trying to ask what's north of the North Pole and think right, there's, right, a right, special, right. there's a special place there. And if we could just find it, we would know what what's north of yeah, the North yeah, Pole. Yeah. And that's the wrong way to do this. You have to dissolve that desire for two worlds, for super thingness, for super substances. And I would put it that many common current conceptions of God are like that. And I think, therefore, actually detrimental to coming into a proper relationship with sacredness. Now, I think that is properly spiritual, that reality, in that it it can afford us, this is what I argued, strong transcendence. We can come into a profound relationship of co-realization, reciprocal opening with it, that's profoundly loving and is not just psychological improvement. It has profound epistemological and ontological transformative impact on our lives. And that's what spirituality is. And if it's something beyond that, I don't really care about it. And I don't know why you would. I mean, because when it's something beyond that, what I have typically found, so this is not a deductive argument, but what I've typically found is when some people want something beyond that, and I'm not accusing you, but there's a hidden narcissism there. They want... There's a secret stuff that will show how super special I ultimately am. And it's like, ah, that's a real deep danger. Yeah. 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 I, I, I'm with you. And I, and I think that there's that, there, there's this piece of, of this part of try like this, this is where Aporia hits. This is where it's, yes, like, you, you have to, yeah. you have to sort of just be, you know, that, that great argument that you make in this talk that I'll tr- like try trying to just sum this up in five seconds that for anything to be intelligible, something in ontological layer higher must be measuring the lower thing. That's right. And that's Wolfgang Smith's argument. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, 
but you run into like the the unmoved mover, the first mover sort of paradox eventually with that. Yeah. And that that's where the aporia hits. And you have to sort of, and I think that's perhaps why noesis, this kind of like direct knowing beyond intellectual knowing is placed at the, the top of the divided line because th there's a level that you like, you can't explain it. Like you just, you have to sort of have that experience you had in bed and then, you know, it may, it's one, again, it's like, it's the anagogic sure. imperative we, of like, you can understand that experience better your whole life, but you can never fully yeah, understand the right. whole thing. And the important thing is to not gather that experience and put it on your ego shelf to shine yes. your narcissism into the world, right? And, and let's remember that noesis is associated with theoria, what we trans, contemplatio. Of course, it's become our word theory, and this is, uh, puts us too much into... Uh, propositional knowledge, but think what a theory does. It takes you into deeper levels of reality and keeps taking you deeper and deeper, right? Now, the word theoria originally meant to travel so you could behold something you couldn't see before. And this, yeah. you have to bring in theoria in the, into the, in this way, into your sense of noesis. Again, it's not a still complete vision. It's like you said, it's this ongoing journey where at, as I journey, I can see more. And because I can see more, I'm afforded to journey more. And this is how, th this is the journey out of the cave. As yeah. I move into the light, I'm blinded by aporia, but eventually I uh, accommodate. And then I can see deeper into the path. And then I walk further into the path, come into more light. I'm blinded. I have to be transformed and so on. It's, it's a traveling that affords the beholding, that affords the traveling, that affords the beholding. And that it, as long as you bring that in, as you said, into your sense of noesis, this properly guards against the narcissistic demand that I can, I can comprehend it in the sense of I can fully cognitively close my the, the hand of my mind around it and take possession of it and put it on my ego shelf and show people how special I am because of the special experiences that I've had that they have not had. And this is a great danger that um, is besetting the spiritual but not religious movement of our time. Yes. So true, John. So true. I could talk to you all day, but I know you got to go. Thank you so much for doing this. I had so much fun. Hope we can do it again. Um, and My great pleasure, Michael. Is there anything you want to mention before I hit stop? Well, I mean, uh, people, please take a look at my channel. Take a look at our wisdom cultivation platform where you can be put in touch with a lot of courses, a lot of workshops, a lot of people awakening to meaning. Um, keep your eye out for you know the, the the main series, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, After Socrates, where you can... After Socrates is what does it properly mean to adopt what we've been talking about as your philosophy of life? What does it mean? What does it really deeply mean? That's what after so and not just theory. I demonstrate practices. I do. I demonstrate dialogical practices with other people. That's all there. And then keep your eye open. And it's not going to come out this year, 2024. Maybe at the end of 2025. But the next big series is walking the philosophical Silk Road, which is about can we create that opponent processing that tone us between Zen and Neoplatonism, so that we can once again open ourselves up to the possibility of a new advent of the sacred that could be transformative for our lives. I can't wait for it. Thank you again.